I became fascinated in the old movie people. I got to know all the old timers the minute I got here, the ones I wanted to meet. And I did. Like who? Uh, Griffith, and I didn't get to know him so well, but I wanted to. And, uh, you know, the obvious ones that you might think of, like Chaplin and uh, Vito and uh, Van Dyke and all those kind of people. Either from Silence or the very beginning of Talkies. I listened to all the stories. I could. It was, it was still close enough then to those days, so it was awfully easy to get to the sources of it all. And it sounded to me like it was a fascinating setup and a wonderful movie to be made about it. You know. Would have been easier then, but now, now you really have to create it. It'd be more of a, be yeah. freer but less true, maybe. But you wanted to meet those people just because you... Yes, not because of the movie. That's yeah. why I, got, I began to want to, uh, Do it. to, make, to make a movie about yeah. it. Because they'd talk about it and talk about their first beginnings and all that. And I became very interested in the early Hollywood, but only when I got here. never struck me before. Yeah. And in a way, you know, Kane was part of that because not the very early Hollywood, but pretty early, this town began to be dominated by Hearst. And it, it kind of came was partly from that road that I came to. In September of 1952, Orson Welles worked with the BBC for a portrait of early American director Robert Flaherty. Flaherty, who directed the first docudrama film, Nanook of the North, in 1922, had passed away the previous July. As Welles just mentioned, when he got to Hollywood in the late 1930s, he was fascinated by early film people, and they were more than happy to share their stories with the then Boy Wonder. In April of 1953, the BBC hired Wells to read one hour of poetry from Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born from parents the same, and their parents the same, I, now 37 years old, in perfect health begin hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. The next month, the Italian comedy Man, Beast, and Virtue debuted, in which Wells co-starred. From September 7th into October, Wells was involved with Ballet de Paris at the Stoll Theatre in London for a production of The Lady in the Ice. In October, the production moved to Paris. Wells directed, wrote the libretto, and was the ballet's costume and set designer. He later told Peter Bogdanovich, it was very successful in London, and only moderately so in Paris, where it was very badly lit as everything always is in Paris. The plot is, uh, a, a girl's been found, like dinosaurs have been found, in a block of ice, and she's on display in a sort of carnival. A young man falls in love with her, and his love melts the ice. But when she kisses him, he turns to ice. A little parable for our times. It would be the only ballet Orson Welles ever directed. At that stage, I was making, I think, five radio series. I was making The Scarlet Pimpernel with Marius Goring. Michael Redgrave was doing Horatio Hornblower for me. And then I was doing a series called Theatre Royal with Laurence Olivier. And when Laurence Olivier wasn't available, Ralph Richardson took over. I had that period, I had under contract to me, besides Orson, Laurence Olivier, Michael Redgrave, Ralph Richardson, John Gielgud. Oh, Alec Guinness worked for me, and anybody else. They were all under contract for me in radio shows. 
In late September of 1953, Broadcasting Magazine reported that Harry Allen Towers had sold shows to both ABC and NBC for the fall. ABC would welcome Horatio Hornblower back for a second season, starring Michael Redgrave. Meanwhile on NBC, a new half-hour anthology program starring Sir Lawrence Olivier, called Theatre Royal, would take to the air. The program debuted on October 4, 1953, with Orson Welles starring in an adaptation of Alexander Pushkin's The Queen of Spades. Pushkin wrote The Queen of Spades in the fall of 1833. It's a short story about how human greed can lead to madness. The National Broadcasting Company presents Sir Lawrence Olivier, your host in Theater Royal. This is Lawrence Olivier. I'm speaking to you from the stage of the Theater Royal Haymarket in the heart of London's theater land. This is one of London's oldest theatres, and it is appropriate that I should introduce the first of this new series of programmes from here. I am at this time rehearsing a new play with my wife, Vivian Lee, and after a short tour, I shall be opening in London early next month. Because of this, although I shall be introducing the programme each week, I am for the first few of this new series inviting some of my own good friends of the theatre to join me and appear in subjects of their own choice. My first guest is a very old friend of mine. A good few years ago, I had the pleasure of appearing as his guest on his own program from New York, and that is why it gives me particular pleasure to return the compliment and to reintroduce you this week to Orson Welles. Orson has chosen a famous story by Alexander Pushkin, which you may know. It is a tale of excitement and suspense, which I think you'll like. Here he is then, Orson Welles, in the role of Hermann, in the Queen of Spades. Three, seven, ace. Three, seven, ace. Three, seven, ace. Three, seven, Queen! Queen! So, they say I'm mad, do they? They say I'm out of my mind. Here in their book of hospital, room number 17. Just as though I were out of my mind. Listen, my friends. Listen. I'm no more insane than you are. No more insane than I was that evening, that evening at Naramov's, Naramov of the horse guards, the night of the card party. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you make out to him? Did you win? Yes, no, 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 no. I lost, uh, just as I always do. <laughs> I always you... have been unlucky at cards. I play carefully. Never raise the stakes, keep my head, never let myself be put out. Yet I always lose. <laughs> <laughs> and you've never been tempted into putting your winnings back onto a sequence? All on one card, double on the second, double again on the third? Not to me, I'm afraid. <laughs> you surprise me. I wish I'd got your temperament. What about Herman here? He's never had a card in his hand in his life. Oh. Yet he sits here till five in the morning just watching us play. Why not? Play fascinates me. Just to watch. And you never want to join in and try your luck? No, no, no. I'm in no position to throw away what I've got in the hope of winning more than I need. Well, if you never start gambling, I suppose you never acquire a taste for it. But you know, there's one person I can't understand. I wonder who's that? My grandmother, the Countess Anna Fedotovna. Oh. She never touches a car. Your grandmother, you... the Countess? Uh-huh. But why should she want to gamble? She's over eight years old. True, but that only shows you've never heard the story. No? Well, what is her story, then? Come on, Tomsky, you cannot leave us all in the air like that. Well, it's very simple, really. 
The Countess knows an infallible system. No, she nonsense. could win every time she played through. Nonsense, my dear Tomsky. There's no such thing as an infallible system. There's always a chance of losing. <laughs> That's why I always refuse to play. There is an infallible system, Herman, if you know it. And the Countess does know it. Now listen to this. About 60 years ago, she was in Paris. Beautiful, rich. And she had a passion for cards. She had a run of bad luck. She lost every time she played. And she ended up, after one particularly bad evening, by owing the Duke of Orléans a very tidy sum. Now, you've heard of the Count Saint-Germain, haven't you? Uh, wasn't that the charlatan who said he was the wandering Jew and pretended to have found the elixir of life? Well, he may have been a charlatan in some ways, but he had extraordinary powers, supernatural powers, apparently. And he was the one who taught the Countess her infallible system. Nonsense. Nonsense, Tomsky. I tell you, there's no such thing. Very well, then. How do you explain this? The Countess asked Saint-Germain to lend her the money. Instead, he told her the secret system. She went back to Versailles that very night, and on just three cards, doubling and redoubling the stakes, she won back the fortune she had lost. But, my dear fellow, that was just a lucky coincidence. No, no. If she had played again, she'd have lost her fortune again. Oh, no. Not when she knew which three cards to play. Nonsense. You see, it had been one of the conditions, by the way, I didn't tell you, that after she played them just the once, she should never touch a card again in her life. And she never has done. You mean to say... You have a grandmother with a secret like that which could make you millions and you've never managed to wheedle it out of her? No. Nobody ever has. Not even her own sons. <laughs> well, I wish the Countess would take pity on me sometime. <laughs> Three <laughs> infallible cards like that and once would be enough. Nonsense. I should retire a wealthy man from that single game. <laughs> 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 Oh, I had scoffed at the tale, pretended to disbelieve it, but in my heart, I knew it was true. There is such an infallible system. There are three cards that will always win. Every gambler knows that there are, knows that there must be. Once in a lifetime, someone discovers the secret, and then their fortune is made. And it was just those three infallible cards that I had always been trying to discover, watching game after game, never playing until I knew which the secret sequence really was. Well, now I know. All night long, I had lain awake, thinking about the secret and the one old woman who knew it. Next morning, I took a walk through the streets of the city. I stopped before an imposing mansion. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Whose house is that over there? On the corner? Yes. The Countess Fedotovna's. A great lady, sir. The Countess? The Countess Anna Fedotovna? That's right, sir. The only one. She's an old lady now, sir. 87, they say. And who is the young lady? The young one sitting at the window. At the embroidery frame. Sir. Yes. Oh, that will be the Countess's young ward, Lizaveta Ivanovna. Lizaveta Ivanovna. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So the Countess has a pretty young lady to look after her, has she? Well. Well, maybe that will prove to be the answer. Yes, she was to be the answer, all right. Lizaveta Ivanovna. Day after day, I went back to the house, standing there in the street, gazing up at the figure in the window, wondering what went on between her and the countess. Did she know the story of the old woman's secret? No. Not until I finally told her. They talked about other things up there in the countess's dressing room. What are you gazing out of the window for, child? Is it so interesting down in the street? I, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't thinking. Not thinking. <laughs> you looked as though you were lost in thought. Maybe you find it far too dull reading to me. Oh, no, my lady. 
Shall I get the book that Prince Pavel sent you yesterday? No, oh, no, I don't feel in the mood for being read to. Uh, all the novels they send me are a lot of ridiculous nonsense. Uh-huh. Is the carriage ready? Yes, my lady. It is waiting at the door to be required. Then I shall get dressed and we will drive to the park. Please be ready to start when I am dressed. Huh? Yes, my lady. Hmm. Natasha. Yes, mademoiselle. Do you know that man down there in the street? He has been standing there all the morning. The officer, mademoiselle? No, I never saw him before. What uniform is he wearing? Well, I am not sure, mademoiselle, but... Yes, he is a captain in the engineers, I think. It is very handsome. The, the uniform, I mean. Yes, mademoiselle. I knew that she had seen me standing there each morning... I had seen her blush and pretend to turn away to her embroidery. But always her eyes stole back to me. And I knew that sooner or later I should succeed. And then one day, as she was helping the old countess into her carriage... Careful. I slipped the note into her hand. I saw her start of surprise. Her indecision. Whether to throw it away or not. Then I saw her hide it in her glove as the carriage drove away. Know then, my adored one, that you are more to me than life itself. Though I have only had the exquisite happiness of gazing at you from afar, I live for the day when I shall hear your voice and when I shall have the courage to declare myself your devoted slave, Hermann. What am I to do? Whatever would the countess say if ever she were to find out? The man is far too bold. I I shall have to return his letter. (laughs) Uh, Yes, yes. She returned my letter. Just as I knew she would. With a brief note of her own. Sir, it said. I am sure that your intentions are honorable and that you have no wish to offend me, but I cannot begin an acquaintance in such an imprudent manner. I return your letter and trust you will never give me cause to complain of your disrespect. Theater Royal was developed to capitalize on Lawrence Olivier's name. At the time the program launched, Olivier and then-wife Vivian Lee were getting set to appear in Terence Radigan's comedy The Sleeping Prince in the West End. The play would run for eight months, it made Olivier temporarily unavailable to star in his own program. Many fine actors of the British stage and screen were involved in individual episodes of Theatre Royal, like Robert Morley, Harry Andrews, Muriel Forbes, and Daphne Maddox. The music was credited to Sidney Torch. Oh, yes, I was in her thoughts. I had every cause to be... For never a day went past now without my sending her another note smuggled into her sometimes one way, sometimes another. Please, be good enough not to bring me any more letters and tell the person who sent you that he... Uh, he ought to be ashamed of himself. But of course, mademoiselle, of course. Even though he is devoted to you. Even though I was devoted to her. Day after day, I begged her, implored her to let me visit her. And it was not long before I was receiving her replies. Before she was telling me that she, too, was in love. Before she was ready to do everything I asked of her. And then, at last, the letter for which I had been waiting was thrown down to me from the Countess's window. Oh, what a letter that was. This evening, there is a ball at the German embassy. The Countess will be there. This is our only chance of meeting alone. As soon as the Countess and I have left for the ball, the servants will be going out and the porter will be in his lodge. Come to the house at half past eleven. Walk straight in. If anybody happens to stop you in the hall, go straight upstairs. Probably you will be seen by no one. If so, turn to the left through the ante room. You will reach the Countess's bedroom. There you will find two doors. The one on the right leads into a study which is never used. The one on the left leads to a corridor, at the end of which is a staircase. It leads to my room. 
I shall have returned by two o'clock. No, there was nobody to challenge me. The porter was asleep in his lodge, and the servants were not about. By half past eleven, I was safely inside the Countess's apartments. But it was not the left-hand door I opened. The one that led on to Ivanova's room. No. It was the door into the empty study. Next to the bedroom of the Countess. There I waited until two o'clock. And in my pocket... There was a pistol. It was half past two before she returned. And I heard them enter the bedroom... Just beyond the door where I was hiding. Good night, my lady. Oh, so you are going to bed <laughs> already, my dear. If you will excuse me, I'm very tired. Very tired, she says. <laughs> A girl of her age. And I tired as well. I thought that Natasha would be attending your ladyship. Oh, to be sure, to be sure. Don't bother about me, my dear. Nobody cares for an old woman like me. Go to bed then if you are so tired. Why stand there arguing? I'm huh? sorry, my lady. Good night. Good night. Girl. Natasha, unlace me. Yes, your lady. Oh, I'll be quick about it. Uh -huh. Mademoiselle is not the only one who is tired. Huh? Oh. I watched the old woman through a crack in the door. I watched the whole repulsive scene and the wig, paint patches and every finery was stripped away and the gaunt unlovely features emerged that fashion and artistry had done so much to conceal at last the maid retired does your ladyship wish to retire or shall i place the chair by the window the chair is well enough where it is uh, oh, to take away the candles i will have light enough from the icon lamp good night my lady good night good night mm -hmm. Oh, what a paltry affair it was tonight, that ball. Oh, it seems they have forgotten what social occasions ought to be, just as the modern world has forgotten how to deport itself. Ah, what days they used to be when Princess Daria Petrovna and I... Don't be alarmed, madam. Don't be alarmed. I am not going to harm you. I have come to ask you a favor. Who are you? What are you doing here? It does here? not matter who I am. But it is in your power to make me happy for life. And it will cost you nothing. What do you want? Madam, I know that you can name three cards. Three cards that are to be played in sequence. Three cards that cannot fail to make the fortune of anyone who knows them. No. No, it was only a jest. I, I swear, only a stupid jest. It is no jest to me, madam. I want you to name those cards for me. I do not know any cards. Why should you keep your secret? Who for? For your grandson, Stomsky? They are all rich enough already. They don't need to know your secret. Besides, they have no idea of the value of money. They would squander it away in a year. With me, with me it would be different. I know the value of money. I live simply. I am not a gambler. I have never touched a pack of cards in my life. I will only touch three cards. Tell me which they are. I do not know any cards. Madame, if you have any feelings at all, by all you hold dear in life, tell me your secrets. No. If you have ever known what it is to be in love, if you have ever known human suffering or sympathy or rapture, by all you have ever felt or longed for, I beg you, tell me! I do not know any card. You old witch! I'll make you answer. See, I have a pistol. Oh, no, no. Tell me. Tell me, you hag. Tell me! Unless you tell me those three cards, I shall... But she's dead. She's dead. Dead. 
The secret is... No. No. No! It was only then that I remembered Elisaveta Ivanovna waiting for me in her room at the head of the little staircase down the corridor. Hammond, where are you? Where have you been? I've been in the Countess's bedroom. I've just left her. The old woman is dead. No. Yes. What are you saying? I am saying the Countess is dead. What's more, I'm afraid that I was the cause of her death. Oh, no. Yes. Tell me. What terrible thing has happened? She died of fright. It was an accident. She had a secret that I had to know. Three cards. A secret that can make the fortune of anyone who knows it. But, Herman, That I... was all I wanted, just three cards. I let myself in just as you told me. I hid myself in the study next to her bedroom. I waited till she had got undressed and dismissed her maid. And then I came out and asked her. So that was why you wanted me to let you into the house. And I thought, oh, what have I done? What have I done? You old fool, I begged her to tell me. I begged her on my bended knees. But the old witch was obstinate. So I pulled out my pistol and threatened her with it. You monster! No, don't worry, I didn't intend to kill her. The pistol wasn't even loaded. It was an accident, a pure accident. But she died. She died. And the secret has died with her. Just three cards. Three cards that would have made a fortune. What a fool I've been. What an utter fool to believe all your lies, to believe that you really loved me, that three it was cards. me you were even interested three in. Three cards, three cards that were worth a fortune. Yes, three cards. And I was the one that was going to help you find them. Oh, what a fool I've been. What a wicked fool. But for me, she would never have died. It was I who killed her. I, her own war. The old woman deserved to die. She didn't, she didn't. She was kind to me. Nobody killed her. The old woman died because she was an obstinate old fool. What is far more important, her secret died with her. Three cards. Just three simple cards. Now, shall I get out of the house? There seems little point in my staying any longer. I was going to show you down the secret staircase. Then show me. Leads down from the Countess's bed. Well, come on, show me. No, I'm afraid. Afraid of seeing her there. Then give me the key. Tell me what it is. I'll make my own way out. The old Countess was dead, and her secret had died with her. Though I hated her for it, her death was on my hand. And the thought began to obsess me. She had died with hatred in her eyes. Hatred as well as fear. And who can say what hatred is liable to do? Even the hatred of the dead. Perhaps you will say that I am superstitious, for I have no faith. But suddenly I knew that I must pay my last respects to her and ask her forgiveness. Poor lady. She died two nights ago, peacefully, in a chair beside her bed. I am sorry. Yes, I am going to the funeral tomorrow at the convent of Our Lady. What time is the funeral? Nine o'clock in the morning. At the convent of Our Lady. I shall be there. You are a good friend, Herman. Thank you. The church was full of mourners, for the old woman had many friends, many acquaintances. Anyone who had lived as long as she had must have had many acquaintances, even if they were only waiting for her to die. The coffin stood on a catafalque under a velvet canopy. The body was laid within it, hands crossed upon the breast, wearing the lace cap and the satin gown. When her relatives had paid their last respect, I, too, approached the coffin. <laughs> Forgive me, old woman. Forgive me. I meant you no harm. 
<laughs> no. No! You see, audiences, in the real sense of the word, are disappearing. There are almost none left. It's an endangered species. Everybody's on? No. You see, this isn't an audience here. No. False pretext. No, no, that's wonderful, lovely people, and we're so grateful for you, but you're not an audience. You got in free. <laughs> an audience? And not, not only did you get in free, but you know, as does every studio audience, that you are not here to do anything except be a member of the cast and to help us look good. <laughs> oh, okay, very much. Final Seriously. Have Final you ever seen, have you ever seen a television show where the audience booed and hissed or refused to applaud? We're always it's a always a big hit on television, we're, isn't it? No, because the people who come to the show know that they're part of the cast yeah. and have to help us not to look ridiculous. Yes. Our real audience is two or three people in a living room scattered yeah. all over the right. place, but that isn't a real audience. No. An audience is a big, many-headed beast crouching out there in the darkness, waiting to eat us up or love us or whatever, and it must be either seduced or tamed or raped or whatever. And it must be dealt with. How because anybody who deals with a real audience, as I have, my goodness, think how long I've been in show business. I've been hissed and booed. I've had things thrown at me. Until you've had that experience, you don't understand what dealing with an audience is. Say that I'm mad, if you like. But the old woman's eyes were open. And they were mocking me. I heard her chuckle. Chuckle horribly. And I was afraid of her. I fought my way out of the church and hurried away to lose myself in the noise and bustle of the streets. All day I wandered about the town trying to forget all that I'd seen. I dined alone and when I got back to my room I locked the door behind me. And at last I fell asleep. When I woke up, suddenly the moonlight was coming through my window. It was three o'clock in the morning. And I heard a distant clock chiming the hour. Who? Who is it? Who's there? Who is it? <laughs> the Countess. Countess Fedosna. I am here through no will of my own, young man. I am here because I have been told, compelled to grant your request. Three, seven, eight will win for you if played in that order, but only on this condition that you play them once and never play again in your life. Yes. Yes, Countess. Countess, I beg your forgiveness. I... Forgive you, my death. But if you gamble more than once, <laughs> I shall return. Yes, I, I accept the condition. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good evening, Carl. Why, Herman, you here? Do you come here to watch the play as well? I have come to play, Marimor. To play? <laughs> but I thought you never did play. I shall play this once. May I take a card, sir? But of course. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your fall from grace, my dear fellow. I shall watch this. Oh, the best of luck to you. Thank you. This is my card. This is my stake. Uh, pardon me, sir, but what is the stake? I cannot see quite what you've written. 47,000 rubles. What? That's a very high stake, sir. A great deal higher than usual. Well, you accept my card or not? Naturally. I must only point out that here we play only for cash. Oh, for my part, your word is more than sufficient, but my part There is, is the cash. Oh, thank you. Uh, if you are ready... The nine and the three. The three it is. I win. I will play again. 
and double my stake. And this is my card. As you will, sir. At your pleasure. The knave and the seven. The seven is my card. I win again. <laughs> you are remarkably lucky, sir. I will play once more while my luck holds. I stake everything. Everything on this card. A queen. And an ace. An ace. The ace wins. Pardon me, sir. That card is not the ace. It's the queen. The queen? Your queen has lost for you. The queen? The queen of spades. But it... It wasn't the queen that I played. It, it was... It was the, the queen of spades. The queen of spades. It is the cursed old woman. The old woman. She has tricked me. Tricked me. Three, seven, ace. Three, seven, Ace. Three. Seven. Queen. Queen. This is Laurence Olivier again. First, I should like to thank Orson Welles for that fine performance in The Queen of Spades. And the other members of the cast who included Ellen Pollock as the Countess, and Cecile Chevreur as Lisaveta. I'm looking forward to next month when I shall have the opportunity of appearing myself in the plays which we shall bring you each week. Until then, I will have the pleasure of introducing some more of my good friends of the theatre, including in the weeks to come, Michael Redgrave, and next week, Ralph Richardson. Until then, au revoir, and thank you. Lawrence Olivier introduced in today's transcribed program, Orson Welles. Alexander Pushkin's story, The Queen of Spades. Once Sir Lawrence Olivier could no longer appear, Sir Ralph Richardson took over as host of Theatre Royal. Selected episodes were repeated, with a different series opening and closing, on ABC Mystery Time in the late 1950s. The show remained in active syndication in the U.S. into the 1970s. Wells briefly returned to America to make his first appearance on TV, starring in the omnibus presentation of King Lear, broadcast live on CBS on October 18, 1953. It was directed by Peter Brook and co-starred Natasha Parry, Beatrice Strait, and Arnold Moss. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Alistair Cook and a very special omnibus. Today... We have only one item, but it is the noblest item in English dramatic literature, Shakespeare's King Lear. We've brought Peter Brook over from London to direct it. Virgil Thompson has written and will conduct a special musical score. And for his first appearance, his first television appearance in this country, you will see Orson Welles as King Lear. Now, the play will run without any division of acts or any interruptions of any kind. And we're very grateful to our sponsors for their generosity in making this possible. When you've heard from the first of them, I'll be back to tell you something about the history of the play and its reputation. Our version of King Lear runs about 73 minutes. And Peter Brook said that if he'd had three hours, it would still run 73 minutes. This was made possible by taking advantage of the very tough requirements of the Elizabethan stage. You know, they had a, uh, only a platform stage and no curtain. And when people came in, they expected a play to run for four hours. So in order to rest the chief actors, they invented the subplot, the bane of all schoolboys. Uh, this brought on the second shift of actors. Well, Peter Brook has simply taken the subplot and thrown it out the window. But everything that bears on the tragedy of Lear is in this version. Now about the play. It was written by Shakespeare in his 41st or 42nd year, at the beginning of the last decade of his life. We don't know much about what happened to him in the six years since he wrote the gay comedy, Twelfth Night. He would never again write anything like that. We do know that he lost an 11-year-old son. 
and that in the preceding years when he was writing Julius Caesar, Hamlet, Othello, he seems to have been obsessed with public vices like ambition and treason and private agonies like jealousy and lust. And now here he came to take a, an old Celtic myth about an aging king who divided his kingdom between three daughters in the hope of ensuring their devotion to him, a hope that you'll see was doomed to defeat. Now for two centuries this play was baffling and it was unpopular. The 18th century didn't like it because they believed, they wanted to believe, that Providence was a very reasonable being who ran the universe in a very orderly fashion according to the new rules laid down by Sir Isaac Newton. So they called it disorderly barbaric. The 19th century, an optimistic age, felt that its pessimism ran counter to the prosperity of the British Empire and the blessings of the steam engine and the export trade. So they said it was very morbid. And now we, at least those of us who've been lucky to survive the violence and the barbarities of the 20th century, maybe we are a little better qualified to look at this work with a little more humility. It is the play of an author who, in the prime of life, despaired not only of men and women, but of the God who made them. But this is not the petulance of a small-town atheist. It is the despair of one of the most intuitive human beings who've ever lived, and of the most greatly gifted of our poets. So, we give you King Lear in the hope that you may learn more from Shakespeare's pessimism than from the optimism of lesser men. Give me the map there. No, we have divided in three our kingdom. It is our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strength. Cornwall, and you are no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a present will to publish our daughter's several dowers, that future strife may be prevented now. Tell me, my daughters, which of you, shall we say, doth love us?